name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we are joined by Mr. Henry Clark, or should I say he has allowed us into his shop on the corner of Detroit and Lincoln here in Toledo, Ohio. Mr. Clark, how are you doing? Wonderful. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. <laughs> Good, sir. Well, thank you for allowing us um, access to your shop. Uh, Mr. Clark, I want to you know, ask you a lot of questions about your life um, here in Toledo, but I would like to begin by going back to your life prior to coming to Toledo. Um, I know that you were born in Mississippi and you later migrated here at the age of 10. Correct. But let's go back. Um, what was life like for you in Mississippi? Well, my mother died when I was uh, a year and 11 months old. When my sister was six weeks old, it was just the two of us. Okay. And <clears throat> we was poor, but we didn't know it was poor. <laughs> and our grandmother took real good care of us there, and she was wise and taking care of us. Okay. And I, for me to get up my chores, I had to go down to the spring and walk around about a quarter of a mile. Okay. Go through the snakes in the woods and get the water and bring it back up the hill. Okay. And then in the fall, they would kill hogs in the water, and that would be our soap that they would make the soap and wash and things like that. Okay. And I wasn't raised around individuals, no whites, very no blacks other than cousins later on. Okay, okay. So we was just about in the wilderness there. Really? But it worked out nice. Okay, because I, I'm, I was going to ask you, I know that if you came of age in Mississippi between 1933 and 43 in that, in that time period, um, that was a time of terrible race relations between whites and African Americans. But it sounds as if you're saying you didn't have much of a problem. Didn't have no problem because I didn't see nobody. Okay. See, I had no race problems in Mississippi. I only run into race problem after I had went in service and come out and realized that it was a difference between races. Okay. I never okay. heard of any, any race slangs or any race anything. Okay. Well, let's go back to Mississippi. As you were in Mississippi, um, what was school like for you? School, they had a teacher that uh, meant well, but it was one house and had from the first to the eighth grade. Okay. And I would go get the wood and everything. and. <laughs> We really didn't learn anything because we didn't have nobody to teach us anything. They did the best they could, but they didn't know what they was doing. Okay. They were well intended. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to imagine then, based on this conversation, that school was predominantly black. All black kids? Yes, it was just a handful. Okay. I'd have to walk five miles going and five miles going, coming back with my sister and I. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Good. Good. But uh, it, it worked out fine. We, we'd walk that little raggedy house be raining. I'd go, when I get there, I'd have to go get the wood, help start the fire. And then they'd come back and try to help us and teach us the best way they could. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I would say probably that you're one of the fortunate Af African Americans that didn't have much encounters with whites in Mississippi, in particular, or blacks. Or blacks. I didn't have any. I didn't have. Any, I was raised up where you go hug a tree and you appreciate life, you appreciate <laughs> the sun, you just appreciate being here. Okay. And all of these things was learned after the tree was straightened up. It may have got tilted a little bit only because I didn't know anything about racial problems. Okay, okay. One way or the other. You know, I think that's interesting because what it says is something that we've always known that uh, discrimination and, and having hatred feelings, that's a learned behavior. People aren't, you don't come into this world hating someone because of their skin color. That's a taught behavior. All I feel that all of it is taught because, like, I didn't know it was a difference between white, black, and ethnic groups until okay. I had went in service, got out, and then I started getting into the job market. Again. And when I got in the job market, that's when I realized that it was a difference between ethnic groups. Okay, okay. Taylor, let's not get there yet. Let me let's sort of back up. Let's talk about the time or the conditions in which you came to Toledo. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> 
when we come here, we come here on a vacation. My dad had to produce us to keep from going in service. Okay. So they put a little tag around our neck, and we rode all the way from Mississippi to Toledo, and we stayed up all night watching the lights because I'd never seen electric lights in my life. Really? No, no electric light, no running water, no house where it wasn't leaking inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we, we rode the train up here, and they met us at the crane station, and that's where we okay. got to come to Toledo. Okay. Now, when you say they, so when you arrived here, who did you live with, and do you recall the address of that place? Oh, 377 Indiana Avenue. Okay. And Comes I stay with my dad and my stepmother. Okay, okay. And now what was your, your, your dad and stepmother's name? My dad was uh, Washington Clark, and my stepmother was Willa May Clark. Okay, okay. Yeah. So then you, you, you and your sister get here at, now you, was, you, you were 10. Correct. And your sister was how old? Eight. She was eight. Yeah. Okay. So you get here and you're on Indiana Street. Correct. And what schools did you attend? Well, I still attended Gunkel School, better known as Duke Moe College, because I never had a fight in my life because there wasn't nobody to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I never had no fight. Really? I didn't know what the fight was. Okay. And we attended Gunkel School, and when I got there, they meant well, but the money must have been funny because they give me one a month and a half of reading, special reading. Mm -hmm. After that, they put me in a dummies class. Really? Had me knitting, crocheting, and broadening, and doing a little shop work. And I stayed there, and I finally went to Jones Junior High, and they tested me and put me in a class and see how I was doing. After I was in there for about a year, they would you like to try the seventh, eighth grade? So I tried the eighth grade, then I went all the way through. During that time, I was excellent in math. Okay. But you have to learn to read in order to do math when you start doing algebra, geometry, and trig. Right, right. And my sister could read, but she couldn't do math. So she went to Case Western Reserve for the Ivy League school. <laughs> and I took up some courses so I could stumble through something. And so I went into Barbara now. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've done just fine, though. I, um, so let's not diminish that. You, you've done quite well. Well, I made a living there. <laughs> well... I always judge it compared to what I would like to do. Okay. I say I'm a poor person. I'm poor not in buying a car or getting a big house or clothes. I would like to do something because of the community. So therefore, I don't have the money to set up where if you wanted a, a handyman or a carpenter or a plumber or someone, I can say, hey, and recommend this fellow. And if not, to help him bring him up to the standards where I think he should be a one plumber or handyman or whatever it be. That's what I would like to do okay. in life. Okay, well, in fact, let me just real quickly touch on something you said about being poor. Where does the name Poor Clark come from? People begging me to death, so I figured if they could be poor, I could too. <laughs> 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 they always told me if you get your lick in first, then you got a fighting chance. <laughs> <laughs> so you're poor, so don't ask you. Well, it's not, don't ask me what I'm saying, think about it. Think about we're it. all poor. Right. If we think we're poor. Okay. We're rich if we think we're rich. That's the reason I say my poor doesn't mean that I don't have enough to go buy me a big car, big house, or big this. Oh, that. Okay. It's poor compared to what I would like to give back to the community okay. as a whole. Gotcha. Okay. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, I, I never, I want to ask you because um, I would ask people, what does poor mean? Um, and at first people would, would say po. I'm thinking, well, what is po? P-O-E. No, P -O -E, no, poor. And so, no, I spell it P-O. P-O. Yeah. That's the country po. That's the country po. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so then let's, let's sort of back up. So you were in Toledo. You attend um, Gunkel. Gunkel. Yeah. And then you go through high school. Yeah, so I went through May Comrade, and played a little football there. And, uh, uh, like, no color bear at all. They all did put me in the, in the student council for representing the class and all that. And it was only around about 20 some blacks in the whole place. And we didn't know it was black. So Maycomer was a predominantly white school then? Not predominantly white. It was all white with the very few black students in there then? 27. 27 black students? Yeah. Okay, okay. And you played football? A little bit the last 21st team that they had. <laughs> uh, were you any good? Well, 
we didn't get into the last minute thing. Okay. <laughs> For what I was playing, I did all right. Well. You did all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay, um, so what did you do after you finished high school? Well, I worked at the Rossford Ordinance. That time the government had jobs, and uh, in fact, I worked before that. In the summer, I used to work on the railroad, which was my first job. Okay. And then later on, before I got out of high school, I worked nights. I would go to school in the daytime and go to uh, Rossford Ordinance in, uh, at night. Okay. And that's why I work. And when they call it reduction in force, so I understand what these people say. Like you have eight years of fat and eight years of lean. We had the lean. Okay. So I was around here and some individuals getting in trouble and I didn't want to get in trouble. So I volunteered to go to the Air Force. I was going to go in the Army, but my sister said she didn't want me in no Army. Okay. So I went in the Air Force and it was as much different between the Air Force and Army as night and day. Well, let's, let's back up though. So as you're growing up here and as you go into adulthood here in Toledo, mm -hmm. what kind of things were you doing socially? Who were some of your friends that you, that you hung out with? I was always a loner. But I like to go skating. I like I was excellent in skating. I could ride a bicycle backwards downtown in heavy traffic, without touching the handlebars, and I had excellent balance. Okay. And uh, I, when I was young, so I set pins. Okay. And I've always worked, and we had a, I had a little money, so okay. I'd have a little nice car, and nice clothes, and so I've always lived well for us. The standards that I was, I always live within my means. Within your means. I learned to spend some and save something. Okay. Because I firm believe I don't care how much you make. If you make a, a million and spend two, you're in trouble. That's right. That's right. <laughs> very wise. Very wise. Yeah. So Let me ask you, as, as you're growing up, before leaving for the service, did you ever sense that there was a lot of discrimination or, or prejudice? Here never you? seen it. Never had any idea there was sense whatsoever. Because <clears throat> I would work. I had the best of both worlds. I had money in my pocket, I had little cars, nice clothes, wore some of the best for the standards we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to the inner city girls where we was at, so therefore uh, the blacks lived in one area and I never was associated with the white once I left school. Okay. So therefore I never had any interaction to know whether they was black or white or poor or rich. Okay. Sometimes the blacks would pick on me because they figured that we dressed a little better than they were. Okay. But I didn't figure that was discrimination. I figured that's one individual out of <laughs> sync with the rest of the folks. Right, right. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. Okay, so then you go to the service. Yeah. And you go to what branch? Air Force. Air Force. I was in the Air Force for four years, and uh, I we did our basic. I didn't realize there was any discrimination or anything like that. And I still didn't hit me that it's a different. When we got to St. Louis, they said all the black airmen go to the back and the white ones to the front. We took our basic in Syracuse, which was no problem. But when we got, we went from there to Texas. Okay. And when we got in St. Louis, we changed. When we got in Texas, they had the signs white, black, drinking fountain, first time I ever seen it in my life. Really? And they had all the segregation, which didn't bother me because I always was a person, if you don't want to be bothered with me, I don't want to be bothered with you. <laughs> so, right. I. Went there, I had a car that the other folks didn't have in service, and I was able to have a nice time there in yeah, Texas. Really. But I seen some things in Texas, but it never hit me that it was a, a whole racial thing. I figured it was an individual thing but between blacks and white and what have you, not as racial. So it didn't never bother me as being a racial thing. No hatred, no regrets. But, but when you saw the colored signs, drinking signs, entrances, there weren't restaurants that you couldn't go to or places you didn't feel welcome as you were in the service? I was refused a couple of times, but I never thought anything as being anything other than that was a certain individual, not as a group denying me. I didn't realize it was a whole state, a whole country denying me. I was figuring it just like you and I didn't want me in there. Okay. So like for instance, if they had a place that you go to the back, if they tell me to go to the back, I keep going. But now that didn't strike you as odd when they told you they told blacks in the back and whites in the front that didn't strike you as odd i had never been around where it was segregation it wasn't you can't be angry at something you don't know about at least i could i didn't know nothing about segregation okay. i didn't know what the word meant okay and i and i really didn't know until i went in service and got out of service okay and when i got out of service 
<clears throat> I got a job on construction. Let me just make, make sure I got this clear. What time, what years were you in the service? Uh, I was in that 53 to 56, 53, 45, 56. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Three to fifty-six. I went to service. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So then, once you get discharged from the service, where do you go? Over oh, well, the nineteen, but when I was in service, when I was in service, okay. okay. I took my basic at Syracuse, and then from Syracuse, we went to Texas, Austin, Texas. It was around a college town. I'm a young fellow with a pocket full of money and a car, <laughs> and they thought I was the king can catch me out. So I, I had a good time. I wasn't worried about nothing else. Right, right. And they treated me very all nice. And uh, then I went from there. I was supposed to go to French Morocco, but a fellow friend of mine told me, you don't want to come there. So I wouldn't go no place. All of a sudden, they drafted me to go to Alaska. He said, it's a girl behind every tree. And out on the island where I was at, I haven't seen a tree yet. <laughs> <laughs> they had tumbling weeds, but it was beautiful land. And one of the time you take, say, for instance, uh, the foxes would turn white, and you see so much snow. Oh, you, when you see mud come, you want to hug the mud. Is that right? But now, if you're in the lower part around Anchorage, there, then it's beautiful. Plenty of trees, plenty of streams, plenty of fish, and all of the things that you want to see. Wildlife. Okay. There. Okay. But I went up on the St. Lawrence Island there, and uh, <laughs> it was nothing that barren land, nothing but a rock. Really? Yeah. And so how were you, how were you treated there? What, what? Excellent, excellent. Uh, a couple of times they had a few little difference, but I thought it was just individuals like you and I having a difference, not as a whole group. And uh, they had a movie coming that across the bright road. And they made a racial slur in there about the guy was blind. And all of a sudden he said, yes, and that black's this and so and so and saying so this and that and what have you. Mm -hmm. And I went to the officer. All the fellas got in there didn't think it was nice because we all in there close. And we didn't want to hear that kind of talk. Sure, sure. But when I went to be represented, to, they come back and say, I was looking at it in a different light. And they were. Really? And it hurt. <laughs> We all had agreed that they shouldn't bring those kind of moves there when we was together. So right. Enough, they separated. But I still didn't hurt as a race. No hurting as a race. Race was unquestionable okay. because they had did nothing to me. I did nothing to them. I had a little money and I've always lived within my means. So life was life very was, nice. Life was good for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then, um, at what point do you begin to realize, oh, oh, Maybe there are some issues because of skin color. When I got out of service, I come in, I was working on <clears throat> down here at Standard Oil. That's in Toledo? In Toledo. Okay. And I was working at Standard Oil, and we was working on a local 500. They had a little, <clears throat> we were winching it up with hand when they got through that. They come there and they put a little guy with a little motor set up, down, stop, Teamsters. Mm -hmm. And then I said, oh. They act like I can't drive a car or nothing, and they put them in there. Then I started looking at the union. We didn't have no no blacks driving, no trucks, no painters, no electrician. Car. Nobody in the skilled trade was black. The only thing you could work was on a local 500. That's when I looked at it. I said, then this is where it become not a bitter, but it was hurting because you was cut off from your money. Then I seen that they was segregate you financially. Tell you could go any place, but I can't go to McDonald's and don't have ten cent <laughs> and a hamburger costs a dollar. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's right. So I'm they telling me I can go, yes I can go. But you can't go if you ain't got the money. You ain't got no money. Then when I realized that it was a difference between black and white when I started realizing that I want to keep some capital and have some money. But then I had a good friend, Jew lawyer there, Kirshner, and he was very wealthy. His son's like me today, and he said that uh, he thinks that I'm a great, and they bring me books and different things to help with my program, help, help people to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that's one thing that I really would like to try to get the boys to do is get a book and read. No, oh, that's your Adopt a Read pro program. Uh, okay, yeah. I want to talk about that, but let me yes. go back first. Okay. Let's, let's sort of fast forward and talk about your barbering career. Oh. What prompted you to get into, start cutting hair? Oh, I was out there at Kellogg's construction, and the zero weather was eight below. Normally, I'd cold don't bother me, but that did. 
<laughs> and, w and we'd go up on the, the scaffolds. And being up on the scaffolds there, the wind cutting you every which way but loose. And one fellow said, Clark, said, why don't you go into Barber, that guy named Williams there. And uh, he said, the more he talked, the better I liked it. The more he said, you can read your paper, you can be clean, and you don't have to be out here. And so I went to check it out. And as soon as that job was over, I went to barber school. Okay. And that's what put me in the barber school, getting out the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and what year was that? Oh, uh, it was uh, 59. 59, okay. <laughs> so you did, you went to barber, barber school here in Toledo? Correct. Okay, so once you finished barber school, what was when your... I went to the barber school, mm -hmm. I couldn't cut blacks hair. It was all white school except two blacks, one fella and myself. So you learned how to cut hair on white people's hair. That's all I could cut, but I got the neighbors to ask my mother that could I, uh, stepmother could I, uh, get some of the neighborhood kids okay. and cut them free, and they said they was happy. And that's where I learned the fine arts of cutting black hair. Is that right? Because that's all I could cut was white hair. Because I hadn't had no training on no black hair. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you get through your your training. Correct. Uh, once you finish your training, get your certificate. What was the first job that you had as a barber? Well, I went to Paul's Barber Shop. I went there and I worked there and I was happy there. Wasn't making much money that six days a week. I was making around about seventy-five dollars a week, and I could have my car and a few bucks, and I was making out. Yeah. yeah. And he went up on the price a dollar, from a dollar and a quarter to two and a quarter, and he had me sitting there sucking my thumb, <laughs> and I figured I could do better than that. So that's when I decided to open the shop. So I put my little skills together, what have you, and I set up and opened a Scott shop there in uh, 61. 61. And I, I dropped the price down to where they used to be, <laughs> and I called myself the dollar man. <laughs> and knowing then, it doesn't look like much, but I had all kinds of Cadillacs and stuff. That's when the, the tax people started looking at me. They thought I was doing something wrong. I was doing nothing but cutting hair all day and night. But I went there. I did real well with it. I used to keep uh, on an average around about 10 or 12 barbers, and we would work night and day. Now, when you when you got opened your own shop, I'm gonna be just so I'm just curious. How many hours would you put in a day? As oh, a, a minimum around about 14 hours. About 14 hours a day. Oh yeah, 14 to 15 yeah, every day. You know, in fact, I want to ask you something that we talked about a little bit earlier about how some barbers, um, see, younger barbers seem to work fewer hours these days. Younger people. Younger people. <coughs> see, during that time. Most individuals work two jobs okay. because they was out of the South and they were used to working from sunup to sundown. Mm -hmm. So it was no problem. And then my parents was taught to work. Like my dad, go out to, he would go to construction and he went to Rossford and he used to do body and fender work. When he'd go on a regular job working and he'd come and go do body and fender work about four or five hours. Okay. See, so when I got up, it was easy to go work on a job and work around that free at the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay. so in return, it was no problem working. Um, with your first barber shop, let's go back to that. How many chair barbers did you have in your first shop? Twelve. Twelve, 12 people. Twelve. And we worked night and day. Did you really? Now, did you require them to be there during a certain time? Eight o'clock until at least nine. Eight if the customer was there. Eight o'clock in the morning? Yeah. To nine o'clock at night? Especially on weekend. Now they through the week they could get out of there at seven. A weekend had stayed in there. If they didn't go someplace, I'd need them. Did you have a lot of turnover? Did you have people quitting a lot? Uh the average barber I would say stayed with me on an average of around about oh ten years. Oh pff. that's pretty good then. Yeah, ten years average. Now you had a few that didn't. Okay. But they say they wanted something, and they was willing to work for it. And I showed them the door how to get it. Cause most people took a barber as extra money, something to throw away, to have a little fun, throw away money. Mm -hmm. I took it as a business to make a decent living off of it. And I figured my barber didn't have the benefits, but they made as much as anybody in the factory made, dollar wise. Okay. Okay. Now what they did with it was their business. But then when they first come, 
They all had to have a Christmas saving. It was a must for them to save some of that money. Now, after they saved it, what they did with it was their business. But I always wanted them to have a nice car, a nice house, nice clothes. So then it was, they were more than just employees for you then? Well, we was co-workers. You know, ain't nobody going to get out of his world alive. And nobody, uh, at least the way I see it. And all we can do is try to give away a little kindness. Because we got a round trip ticket, and one of these days we got to cash it in. <laughs> you know, that's right. We got to cash it in, and we didn't bring nothing in the world. We're not gonna carry anything out. That's right. And the only thing we can try to get away is a little love. Yeah. At least that's the way I see the reflection of yourself. No, that that's very. Um, I think that's very wise. How many locations have you been in since you? Two. Two locations. Yeah. Every renewal took to my place down there. And then I had them to fix this one up here. Okay, so you said that you've been at this location for what, 39, 40 years? 30 years. 38 years? Mm -hmm. And I was down the street 10. 10. So how many barbers do you have in this shop then? I have eight now. You have eight? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I have eight. <laughs> Sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave, it. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that one. Um, let me ask you, what's, I mean, I know barbers come and go, shops don't always succeed. What's the key to longevity in this business? Well, take it as a business. Any time a person take it as a business, they'll do well and they'll make a living. Okay. But you've got to want to make money. Well, I don't say about make money. You got to see one thing I found out. If you treat individuals right, the money will come. Individuals don't mind paying for good service. That's the only thing we'd be selling is service. My haircut is not that much better than the other fellows. It's, they like your conversation. I had a lot of fellows used to come every week just to talk to me. Customer service. Yeah, good service. You know, I want you to comment on something. Uh, there's sort of this, this notion in the black community that the barbershop is more than just a place to get a haircut. What you're saying now? Well, with me, Situation that I've never been painted a, uh, a broad brush. Oh, it's a black shop, true. But when I first opened up, half my customer was white. Is that right? Okay, because you could cut white hair. Well, it was a white area. And once I made them comfortable, they didn't mind coming in. And they was very comfortable in the shop because the whole neighborhood was white. Okay. And well, they was right at home. Okay. And as long as I was there, they was going to treat them right, and no other way else they couldn't stay. I mean, the barbers, they had to treat them right okay. and give a one service. Okay. And like now, we have quite a few Mexicans here now, and I have one white barber. He's, uh, oh, goodness, all, I tell you. Okay, yeah. okay. Good, good. Yeah. So you've been in this location. Um, has the community treated you well in this, in this immediate area? Well... Let me give you a little bit and I'll answer that. <clears throat> they had a person move to a town. And they say, this is terrible. I say, how is the town here? They say, how was the way you were left from? Well, they was terrible. They said, well, it's going to be terrible here. So the next person come along, they say, they come and say, how is the town? Say, so how was the way you left from? He said, it was wonderful. So it's going to be wonderful here. So I'm saying that to say it's here. It's a reflection in the mirror. You get back what you put out. If you put kindness out, kindness come back. If you put negative out, negative come back. So the community and individuals there, they're wonderful. I've had no problem with nothing black, white, or any of them. Okay. Okay. Good. And if you if you have a problem with it, bite your lack of teeth, eliminate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Um, I know that you're currently involved in a in a project which helps what inspires children to read. Talk a little bit about how you got involved in that and why do you think it's important for children to be able to read? Well, I got involved that through Reverend Brock. And uh, <clears throat> the reason I think it's important because I never learned to read well. Okay. And uh, it's just like uh, <laughs> uh, oyster there. It has that itching thing that before it become a pearl. In order for them to become a pearl, then they'll have to get out and work hard and learn to read because there's no elevation without education, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Now, I can figure well, 
But I can't go from here to Detroit if I can't read. That's right. <laughs> I'll start in Detroit, one of California, Mississippi, any place, but where I'm going. Right. So that's the guide road and the path to success. At least that's just the way I see it. Whatever you do, you've got to be able to read, and more so than ever. Like I tell them in a minute, a diamond was just an old rock until it had a lot of friction. Right. And reading is that rock, and you <laughs> got to get that friction together in order to become a jewel. That's right. That's right. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, uh, Mr. Clark, as we begin to, to, to wrap up, um, is there anything that we've not talked about that's significant in your life that's worth mentioning? Well, motivation. How do you motivate individuals? You gotta keep trying. And I don't know whether we tried hard enough or what have you. Example to me is the best way to do it. And then motivation, motivation. And ask the youngsters, how do they observe us? What can we do to get along better with them? Instead of trying to put our views on them, let them wow. put their views on us. And I think that you get a hold to a few of them, and I think we may be able to point them in the right direction, at least a few. Okay. But I know I've been happy with a few that I've had, and uh, <clears throat> I tell them, if you don't want to be, have a dummy like me for your balls, get your education so you can be the balls. Because you're going to have an uneducated person telling you what to do because you have a better personality than you. <laughs> At least that's just the way I see it, you know. No, that's very Life, profound. You know? very profound. I mean, I, I think yeah. you're right. I mean, um, listening to younger generations and not judging them, mm -hmm. um, because all generations change over time, of course. Yeah. Mr. Clark, last question I'm going to ask you. We just elected our first African-American president, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, in your mind, did you ever think you'd see that day happen? Not in this life. And the reason why is because I didn't ever think he would get the back end of the money behind him to help him out. It's always been some individuals willing to push vertically, but not financially. And in this world, don't nothing move without some finance. At least that's the way I see it, you know. Mm -hmm. You need finance in order to help you move forward okay. at anything you do or undertake. And in doing so, if you take a positive thinking, and remember, life is the gift, but I figure charity begins at home and spreads abroad. If I can't do nothing for me, I sure in the heck can't do it for nobody else. Then you have to learn to save, save, save. And these youngsters now don't understand saving. Years ago when I was coming up, you'd take grandma, she'd have a old handkerchief, dirty handkerchief. She'd have a piece of money <laughs> in this corner, this corner, this corner, and this corner. But she never was broke. She learned to manage what you have. Individuals want to get rich and try to manage. If you can't manage a dollar, you sure in the head can't manage a million. It just don't work that way. At least that's the way I see it. I see these youngsters come up broke. They say, oh, he made all that money. He was a dancer. He was a rapper. He was a singer. He could have been a scholar. Mm -hmm. He know nothing about finance. That's right. The old lady with that handkerchief could have taught him more about that finance and all the education he had. That's right, that's right. <laughs> because if you don't save no money, everything you got is lost. I figure we grow old too soon and too late smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Clark, it sounds as though you've been pretty smart all of your life. No, oh, my sister was the brain. Oh, boy. She said I was, I, was, I was all right, but we were just two twins, <laughs> like right. two twins. Oh, she was the brain, because that she, uh, uh, she was at school and the lady gave her uh, a B, because she said, I don't give blacks no A. But now she went to the Ivy League school and got all A's, and they liked her so well they had it. Then they start paying in the six figures to teach them over in Africa how to become uh, really the case was the really how to become nurses and what have you. So, like I said, she was she was nice, <laughs> but she would 
She always said that I was smart, but I just needed you know, a chance to get educated. See, I never learned to read well. I almost figured, and shoot, that was a gym, a trick, but they'd have to read it to me. I could carry the average. Used to carry two and two now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just from, from my viewpoint for what it matters, I think you're bright and you're you a lot of wisdom, something that everybody don't have. And so I think um, you're much brighter than you think you are and give yourself credit for it. Well, I learned from everybody I run into. Individuals like you all is a big help because I ask for a good thought from just about everybody I run into. And be, when they get together, I piece them all together. And it's not my thought, it's theirs. That's right. Well, good. good. And I used to always give out gifts to the schools and the youngsters with good grades. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And there's the old lady always could come here and get something to remind my token for the grade, for good grades. And even once in a while, I get my for bad grades. <laughs> Let me go back because I do want to ask about the uh, the program which you cut hair for children that read a book. Oh, Explain yeah. how that works again. I don't want okay. To miss that. Now, if they go to the library and get a book, and they better not fool me because, like, I'm going to ask them a question, <laughs> they can get a free haircut on Tuesdays at no cost. Really? Now, I had one youngster, he's my life story, and I will always will tell you. <clears throat> He went and he brought a children's Bible. I said, we're going to cut your hair free this time. But go to the library and get a book from the library. Okay. He come in again. I asked him about it. He brought a book, good book. It was 12 years overdue. <laughs> <laughs> and he was 12 years old. <laughs> I said, I'm going to still cut it. But don't you come back no more until you go to one of the hour to lead a library and get a book. You get a real book and bring it back <laughs> but i haven't caught him yet no more so if i'm out here i ask them i quiz them so i want to know the author and something about the book i don't care what it is got to tell me something about it do you really oh yeah see because if you know the author and know a little something about it then you can you, you you've done you at least got to start it absolutely, absolutely because getting the book and looking at it ain't nothing gonna go into it if you don't <laughs> <laughs> Reach that, take it out. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, so again, that's just another shining example of how much you have given and continue to give to this community beyond cutting hair. I mean, I think you are helping to inspire um, young people to read, and I think that's that's just admirable. There's no other way to look at it. Um, one question I was going to ask you about: um, Are you still cutting hair? I cut a little hair, and I do a little hair. I'm a beautician too, as well. I took the beauty course when you had to take the whole course. And I did more hair out of than anybody in the country at one time. Did you really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they give me good, fast hands and a good, healthy body <laughs> up until now. Okay. And uh, it's hanging in there. Okay. But oh, yeah, I used, to, I used to do more hair than anybody in the city at one time. And I used to cut more than anybody in the city. But, like I said, it, oh, good, I'm a firm believer. <laughs> if you make one step, the good master make two. But if you sit there and knock, <laughs> And don't make no step. That's the way you be said. That's right. <laughs> nothing venture, nothing gain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Clark, let that then be the last word. And once again, let me thank you for allowing us to come into your shop today. Um, you know, I think you have been such a wonderful inspiration to the people of Toledo. You've made huge contributions beyond what you know. And on behalf of Toledo, let me say thank you. Okay, my pledge. Okay. You know me. Tell my talking, I'll talk from now. <laughs>